All right. So, uh, Louise Harder, Michigan Higher Education Network Coordinator, and I want to qualify that, that before, when she filled out this bio, that's what she was doing as my hand coordinator, but she's been recently named the uh, Interim Executive Director for Prevention Network. So, Louise is the Interim Executive Director for Prevention Network, oversees a group of over 100, well, it kind of doesn't apply anymore, but I'll just read it. Over 130 college, university professionals, and local coalition partners in Michigan aimed at discussing evidence-based prevention efforts on school campuses. Louise graduated from Oakland University in 2017 and has a background in implementing evidence-based wellness strategies to students and faculty at a Division II university. Louise was named one of the top 10 alumni with 10 years, within 10 years at Oakland University and Michigan Prevention of the Year in 2019 by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Service. She is currently working on her prevention specialist certification through the Michigan Certification Board for Addiction Professionals. So it's my uh, pleasure to, to introduce my colleague and supervisor, Louise Harder, and we'll turn it to you, Louise. Thank you for helping us out. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction, Mike. Um, Okay, should I be able to see my screen? Um, hi everyone, like Mike said, I am the um, now Interim Executive Director at Prevention Network, but formerly the Michigan Higher Education Network Coordinator at um, PN. And my presentation today is on Prevention and Higher Education 101, Partnering with Campuses on Prevention. Some of the topics that we're gonna go through today, um, discuss the general structure of college campuses. Uh, we're gonna brainstorm the benefits of collaborating with schools to improve town down relations. Don't worry if you don't know what that is, I'll share more. Uh, tips for getting your foot in the door. And then at the end, I will share resources for collegiate prevention work. Um, I will also share my slides at the end of this with Mike, who can um, share it out with all of you. And in those slides, I do have citations for people, um, as well as uh, links. So you'll have access to all of this. So I do want to share, Mike did a wonderful job of um, giving a little bit of a background, but I do want to share a little bit of what I bring to the space um, to give everyone an idea of my background. So when I was a an undergrad student. Um, I was a resident assistant on campus and I was later a student leader and peer educator on a college campus. Um, shortly after I graduated, I worked at in student affairs at a division two university. Um, I worked with both student and employee wellness. Um, I'm a public health educator. I was the Michigan Higher Education Network coordinator for about three years. And I'm fairly well connected at the national level with other um, national or with other colleges and universities, but also um, statewide coalitions that are doing substance misuse prevention on college campuses. So um, that's where I bring a lot of this information to you. So I want to start a little bit by sharing the, um, the structure in higher education because I think it's helpful to explain this, this structure in order to figure out who to talk to um, or who you are talking to and kind of how to break in. I also wanna note that college campuses are all set up just a little bit differently depending on their size, type, and if they have a specialty. For example, a large uh, research-based uh, institution university versus a community college might be very different or a little different in how they're set up. However, there are some overarching similarities. So this is just a very basic overview of the hierarchical um, uh, structure of a college or university. So most are uh, overseen by a board of trustees um, <clears throat> and they oversee the large um, goals and objectives of the university itself. Um, they also uh, tell the president kind of what to do and then we have the president of the university who oversees all pieces of um, university functions. Below the president, it kind of splits to two different sides. So on one side here, you have the student affairs or the dean of students um, side of things and that the VP of student affairs or dean of students oversees. And then on the other side, you have academic affairs and that's uh, run by, or usually overseen by a, a vice president of academic affairs, or sometimes they're called a provost. 
Um, the academic side, then it goes down deans, chairs, and faculty academic staff. Um, so that's the, and they're very split, um, usually. Uh, sometimes there is some crossover, especially with smaller schools, because they have less staff. Um, but the student affairs side, so then you have possibly your director of counseling, student involvement, student conduct, director of wellness and health promotions. So you have all these different um, uh, divisions or uh, departments within student affairs. Sometimes we hear the word silos in colleges and universities, and that means that each department isn't necessarily talking to other departments. Colleges and universities are pretty notorious for their financial aid office is so busy and has so much um, or does so much work within um, uh, financial aid that they're not necessarily talking to multicultural initiatives and some of these other groups. So um, sometimes bringing together what's going on in different departments on campus is important, but it's also important to know that if you talk to one department, you may not be talking to every department <laughs> um, and they may not know what each other are up to. So that could be a, a, a possibility or something um, that, that you could bring to the table. Um, this also might be helpful if you need to work up the chain for major decisions or understand there is um, some bureaucracy and there is um, some steps, uh, communications departments and um, a higher level uh, authority for some major decisions. And that might be why it, it might take a little bit longer um, to get your foot in the door with some of those things. Um, and lastly, uh, they do tend to keep a lot internal and that's due to a lot of the resources and expertise they have within and just the way historically colleges and universities were set up. So it's not always easy to get your foot in the door or break in but it is possible. And um, I think that leads us right into the next thing that I wanted to talk about. And it's called town gown relations is what we call it. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, town gown means two distinct communities at a university town. So town being the non-academic uh, population or the community at large um, outside of the university and gown being the university community within. So to give you a little bit of background, the idea of a school in higher learning as a distinct and autonomous institution within an urban setting dates back to the academy founded by Plato in circa uh, 387 BC. The academy was established as a sacred sanctuary for learning outside the city walls of Athens and fully funded by the Catholic Church. Consequently, the universities were largely independent of municipal revenues and to a great extent of civil authority. The towns themselves had uh, legal systems totally different from the surrounding countryside. And even inside the town, every guild usually had its own special privileges and rights. And the independent jurisdiction of the universities essentially was part of this system. And over the centuries, the relationship between town gown has remained kind of ambivalent and there have been points of where a university in crisis has been rescued by the urban dynamics surrounding it, while at other times urban developments have threatened to undermine the stability of the university. Conversely, there have been occasions when the university provided a focus and co um, coherence of the cultural life of the city, though at other times it has withdrawn into itself and under, um, undermined urban culture. Despite the clashes at times, universities and host towns have incentives for cooperating. So that's a little bit about town gown relations. And you can see that on um, different campuses. I started out, uh, my first college I went to was Albion. Um, and they're very distinct, the university versus the town across the street. Um, some colleges and universities are a little bit less so, some are more so. Um, and it really depends on the relationship that they have with the outside community. But there are so many benefits to collaborating. And with that, I kind of want everybody to share in the chat box what you think some of those benefits might be. All right, and I'm 
not able to see right now. You might need to read some of those. You said you're not able to see, Louise. I found it now, sorry. Um, reducing binge drinking, yes. Shared university facilities, for sure. More effective prevention, increase in resources. Wider reach for awareness. Yep, benefits of collaboration are getting more people involved, raising knowledge, increase in prevention, help with growth in the community for reduction of mentor programs, reducing drug and alcohol use for kids, all great different points of view from non-academics. Yeah. Economic development, for sure, that's a huge one. Um, I also like to say that uh, you are kind of the expert in the field when it comes to substance misuse prevention. They might be the expert in the field when it comes to collegiate prevention or the collegiate population. So it's kind of working together with that. So I'm gonna share a little bit about the college landscape, and then we're gonna come back together with how to better connect on college campuses. So some of the top substances of concern on campus. I don't think any of you are surprised to know, alcohol is the top um, substance misused on college campuses. This data comes from Monitoring the Future. This is the 2018 data. 75% um, of uh, students report using alcohol in the past year, and that is 40% of women reported being drunk in the last month, and 35% of college men report being drunk in the last month. Alcohol is the most widely used drug on college campuses. Um, not a surprise there. Those rates as far as um, uh, binge drinking have decreased, but the um, rates of, of those with um, heavy drinking or very heavy drinking have increased. And I'll share that in, after this slide um, a little bit more or two slides down. Um, but some other substances. So cannabis is the second most used drug on cam college campuses. Uh, probably not a surprise there. 25% of college students reported past 30 day use. 6% uh, report daily use and two times um, daily use or daily use is twice as high um, among college men. And then vaping also continues to rise. So we see alcohol rates are decreasing slightly. Um, they're, they're still higher than any other substance, um, but cannabis and vaping are increasing. So that's um, of other concern um, in 20 or 25%, depending on cannabis or nicotine. Um, back to drinking, so binge drinking, we are below 30% for the first time in college students. Again, this is all monitoring the future in 2018. Um, so that, that rate is getting better, um, but it's still pretty high. And then um, I do have some information and data from the American College Health Association. And um, this is a, a common uh, survey that's used among college campuses across the country. So, um, and I did want to note a few things, almost 13% of students scored at moderate risk use and 1% scored at high risk use of alcohol based on um, their metrics. 12% uh, of students reported consuming seven plus drinks the last time they were in a social setting. Um, that's pretty high risk and concerning. 53% of students reported consuming five plus drinks in a sitting within the last two weeks. So um, some of those weekend uh, social activities um, is where a lot of that comes from. And so um, those are definitely areas that need to be worked on. I also do wanna point out that 1.8, almost 2% of students do report being in recovery from alcohol or other drug use, which is actually a really large number of students. Uh, so collegiate recovery uh, efforts and uh, programs or communities are, are definitely important and sharing this information and starting to collect this inf uh, data is huge for, for a college or university and those in long-term recovery. So this, um, this slide comes from a MyHand survey that was conducted three years ago. Um, so it's a little outdated and old. You can also see there was not a lot of response to the survey. So take it with a grain of salt. 
However, um, based on my conversations with a lot of schools, especially schools who are just joining the MyHen, um, a lot of times they are reaching out and saying they are sharing referrals to the area, in-house counseling, online resources, um, tabling at um, different events. Some of these things that are pretty easy to do or low cost prevention services, but are not very effective. So um, very few are doing the motivational interviewing, peer education, or, or that's less common, the bystander intervention. Um, collegiate recovery is starting to increase um, on our college campuses, so that's exciting. Um, but that's one place where you could kind of bring your expertise and share. Well, that's, that, that's great, but let's maybe add to it and create more of a multi-component approach. Or let's take a needs assessment and try and figure out where is your campus at and how can we take it to that next level. <clears throat> so getting your foot in the door. Not super easy. Um, but definitely possible. And once you get in, um, it's a whole lot easier because you know who you're connected with and you've built those relationships. So um, one of my biggest tips and suggestions is connecting with schools where they are at. Um, talking to different schools about uh, what are the needs assessments, why did they choose that prevention effort, share some of the benefits of collaboration, but realize the costs. Um, so th there are quite a few costs of, of working with an outside group. They, um, especially if uh, it's the first time and you're collaborating on a bigger program, um, there, it can be difficult to, um, they have to get a lot of approvals, they have to get a lot of, uh, it, it could be more time for them. Um, realize that it, they may not be as interested with outside um, work in communities. Um, they're very different from a K-12 setting, uh, so you can't use K-12 prevention. Um, and realize that you can bring some of that expertise and you can kind of take the burden off, make it a low cost um, support for them and, and collaboration, um, but share what you can do for them instead of, and at first it might be you are doing a lot more of the work than they are um, and bringing it into them and not so much, it's not as reciprocal at the beginning. Um, because they're, they're usually strapped for time. The other thing I do want to note is when community colleges especially, um, usually they're, uh, they usually have, when you look at the academic side and the student affairs side, the student affairs side has very limited staff and resources. So it could be one person doing drug and alcohol prevention for the entire campus, uh, and they're, they have no background in, in wellness, health promotion, um, uh, public health. They have no idea about substance misuse prevention. They're thrown this as a side thing. Maybe um, they may have 10, 15% of their time uh, dedicated to that, that topic, which is very low for, for what's actually needed. But they don't have... They don't have the resources or capacity to learn more. They don't have the expertise or background. Um, and adding something else to their plate may seem too overwhelming. So try and figure out a way to frame it that um, kind of takes that burden off of them uh, it, it, and you can bring it in and support them um, uh, instead of instead of making it more difficult or uh, or more work coordinating, things like that. Um, if there's anything that you can help with that. Um, you, I said this before, uh, but I'll say it again because I think it's worth mentioning. You know prevention, but they know the campus better. So um, make sure that you're, you're aware of that. And I even like to share that. I say, uh, I, I like to share with schools um, when they ask me, what, what should I do, Louise, for, for my prevention effort this year, or um, prevention strategy um, in the next few years? And I said, I don't, you know your campus better. I can share with you the list of evidence-based um, best practices. I can share with you some different ways and strategies for implementing some of these. We can walk through this. I can give you resources. But at the end of the day, they need that buy-in and they need to, um, 
kind of share more of, uh, of what they think would work on their campus because me coming in and telling them what to do may not work. Um, and then the last one I wanted to share, um, support them with the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act or the DFSCA. For those of you who don't know, um, it, uh, President Nixon um, implemented the DFSCA when he was um, president. And basically it says that the schools, not only K-12, but also mainly college campuses, are required to do drug and alcohol prevention on college campuses. So there are two pieces, well, two main pieces to the DFSCA. So one piece is that they have to do continuing substance misuse prevention, and they have to share these, well, let me back up. They have to have policies and procedures implemented that support federal guidelines um, and federal law because they are, uh, schools are federally funded. Um, they can also share state law and kind of that piece too, um, if it's more robust. Um, but they have, to, they have to follow federal guidelines and they have to share that out annually, not only with students, but also faculty and staff. So usually that's in their policies or their handbook or something like that. The other piece is they have to do a biennial review, sharing that they um, shared this annually with faculty and staff as well as students um, and what uh, campus prevention programs they did on campus over the last two years, um, what the gaps in prevention were, uh, what the barriers were, kind of what their data was. It's a, it's a very full, um, robust report um, and it's done usually in even years. So 2020 is um, sometime this fall, uh, schools should be um, making that public and sharing that. Um, that can be FOIA'd, that is a public document. Um, it usually then just sits on a shelf until two years later when they have to get it back out again. Um, but it shouldn't sit on a shelf. So that's another thing. Um, share with them. I can help you with creating a more robust program and help supporting some of your um, prevention efforts to beef up your DFSCA. And I'm happy to sit down with you and let's look at what um, last, the last two years or the last biennial review was. Um, and let's see how we can kind of build upon that. Or uh, part of the um, biennial reviews shares what prevention strategies they want to implement in the next two years. So maybe we pull that back out together and see what pieces of that do we want to continue implementing. So I do want to pause for a little bit because I threw a ton of information at you uh, in a very short period of time. And I did want to um, just take a step back and see what are people, um, are people connected with their college campuses already? And if not, what, um, uh, what barriers are, are people encountering? Feel free to share in the chat. If you also raise your hand, I don't mind if we um, unmute people. I want it to be more of an interactive conversation. <clears throat> Go ahead, Sandra, you have something? That was you? No, I don't, sorry. No worries. So most people aren't very close. Emily, you have something? Yeah, I, ooh, can you mute that? Sorry, we've got two people in the same room. Can you hear me now? Oops. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that part of our problem is that we're a countywide coalition and we have um, like three institutions here. And so we don't always know, like, we don't always know who to connect with and like we kind of 
want to connect with everybody. And so do you have any suggestions on that? Should we like start with one school or should we slowly try to break into at all of them? Does that make sense? I, I think a little bit um, when you're talking, so you're, where are you located? We're in Genesee County. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there are quite a few s schools. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so we have um, U of M Flint, we have um, Kettering. Kettering, Matt, uh, yep. we had Baker, um, yep. yeah. No, I think that's a great question. Um, so, do, is there any, <laughs> so if there's any cross collaboration with any school, which doesn't always happen, but every once in a while I see um, one school will reach out to another um, to, to do some sort of, um, sometimes I see it with the flu shot or something okay. um, where they'll collaborate. Then you can reach out, do like a, hey, let's do a big um, event type thing. Um, a lot of times these schools are doing tabling events or um, like a, a wellness fair type thing. That can be a great way to break in. Um, and that would be more of an individual break in type thing. Uh, or um, kind of get your foot in the door there. Um, when And it's not a very big evidence-based, it's, it's hard to connect with students and to talk about um, different prevention efforts. Um, the other piece with, with Genesee County is every school is kind of in their own, um, they're in a kind of a different stage of, or what I would say stage of uh, implementing different prevention strategies on campus. Uh, for example, I know that U of M Flint has a little bit more of, they have a, I don't know if it's, they meet monthly or every other month, but they have a committee of people across campus um, talking about what prevention strategies they're going to implement the next year. So if you reach out to Hara or myself at the end, I'll give you our contact information. Um, we can add you to the MyHen and I can connect you with a few people at some of these schools um, that could be key people for um, getting, getting your foot in the door there um, and sharing. And I think once you get in one place, it might be a little bit easier to get buy-in at other places because if one school is doing it and they see the benefit, um, other schools tend to kind of, it, it makes it a little bit easier to buy in and to kind of see, oh, this is what you're doing or this is the benefit that it could bring our school as well. Um, so that may be kind of helpful. And we already have some of those contacts and I'm more than happy to share. So that's one piece that can be really helpful. Um, as far as um, who, who to contact, <clears throat> excuse me, if in doubt, I, I usually try and go into the counseling center, especially <laughs> smaller schools, that tends to be the person that um, is supposed to be doing prevention work. Um, I don't know how counselors really supposed to be doing a ton of prevention. They're more on the, the treatment side or doing, you know, mental health education and things like that. Um, and so they're already overwhelmed or usually they're understaffed <clears throat> and it's not a great department to put that in but that's where it tends to be housed. Um, and so partnering with them on some of those efforts, if they have a larger wellness um, center, sometimes it's housed in recreation, sometimes it's housed just directly under um, Dean of Students, that would be another good um, opportunity or way to break in. Um, I've definitely gotten the response, hey Louise, I'm too busy for this. Um, that's fine. Um, you're, you're really, I mean, so it's, it's tough. It's really, it's really difficult. Um, so finding those connections anywhere you can, or if you have another contact on campus, hey, can you introduce me to um, someone from the counseling department, or can you, you know, um, some of those things. So um, those are my suggestions. I hope that helps. That does. Thank you so much. And we have, um, like, U of M Flint has a wellness fair every. Um, winter that we've been to and we have been we're really connected with the um, one of the officers at Mott one of the police officers at Mott he's been very helpful because they have a prescription drop drop box on their campus so we do have some context but we just haven't done like really a lot of work with at the student level that I'd like to see so thank you so much for that yeah yeah 
Um, I also see <clears throat> in the question uh, for people was, are you, are you already connected with your college campus in the area? And if not, um, what are the barriers? What questions do you have? Um, I kind of want to open it up to a public forum for a little bit. I've and got a comment from, I think Angel wants to say something. Go ahead, Angel. Hi, good morning. I was just going to kind of comment on the previous question. I know through some of the, especially high schools within Genesee County, a lot of the ways that we were kind of getting prevention into the school system was through the community school director, um, which I also collaborated with Crim Fitness. So that was, um, cause a lot of, I know there's a big barrier dealing with Genesee County with the ordinance in the schools now is so, they're so, skeptical on bringing in like different assessment courses for the kids and prevention courses for, um, for the students based off of the ordinance from the administrative aspect. So I think once we try to hit the administrative aspect on getting those ordinance in the school system, it would be a lot more easier and, and kind of break down that barrier for us getting that information in. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really great point. Um, it, yeah. In, in working with the community and seeing, yeah, some of those, the what are the barriers and how can we break them down and the ordinances and the, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. And Marianne Vergeth, did mention in the chat that she will be presenting on Friday at 1.30 about um, her collaboration with Oakland University on a positive community norms campaign, which is super exciting. Um, I remember that campaign because I was on my way out the door at Oakland University as it was being implemented. So I remember the data collection leading up to it. So um, very cool. I'd highly recommend going to that if you're able. Kathy said that there's a project director from our local four-year uh, university who is part of um, the coalition. He has helped us develop and synthesize data from the focus group interviews and reports. That's incredible. And the DFC um, A document is available for public view on the university's webpage. That doesn't happen very often. Most people don't um, share it publicly, especially if they're a smaller school. Um, but those who do have a, a public view on the um, web page, that I, I think that shows a lot about um, their their commitment to substance misuse prevention and things like that. So thanks for sharing. Did I miss anybody else? All right. Well, perfect. So yeah, connecting. Um, it's not easy and I don't have, the problem with this is, uh, or the difficulty that I have with this is every school is slightly different as far as um, how to connect and things like that. So another suggestion I do have is to connect with the um, MyHen and get involved with that. Um, with that, I do share, or Hara will be sharing a contact list with, uh, for everyone uh, who is a part of the network. Uh, and so that might be helpful as well. So then you have a contact of who's designated at those colleges or universities. I have 52 of the around 90 schools um, in Michigan. I have at least one contact for. Um, I do know that schools are interested in partnering, um, especially in the UP. So if you are a UP member or um, uh, if you live in the UP and are part of a coalition there, um, feel free to reach out to me and, um, and I will definitely um, help connect you with the right people if I can. Um, if not, I'm happy to brainstorm one-on-one -on -one as well about how to kind of bring this together. So I also wanted to share some collegiate prevention resources. The first one that I share or that I um, wanted to mention is the college aim or the alcohol intervention, downloading it, making a copy, um, and then adding whatever you need for your um, or is pertinent to you in your area. 
The next one is the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Other Drug Misuse Prevention. It's the HEC AOD. Um, it's a really long name, but this is a great resource with um, national, um, it, it, they, they're pretty much like a national resource house for collegiate prevention activities. Uh, they're very helpful and kind um, if you reach out to them. They have a free weekly newsletter on collegiate prevention activities and what's going on. So if you want to tap into the collegiate space, this might be a great resource and way to easily digest the, uh, a weekly newsletter or something. I know everyone gets too many emails as it is, but I always find this one to be probably one of the most helpful, if not the most helpful resource um, if you want to break into the collegiate sector. Um, so that's a great resource. A lot of colleges and universities, or some, at least, at least a good number of colleges and universities are also already um, connected with HEC AOD in some way. If, uh, if you ever hear Screen U um, or, yeah, the Screen U program, um, that is run out of the HEC AOD. So that might be a good common connection. Uh, the next one is the Association for Recovery in Higher Education, the ARHE. That is the national um, kind of collective point for all um, collegiate prevention or collegiate recovery communities or programs, the CRP or CRCs. Uh, you can hear them um, talk about that. Um, that's a lot more um, uh, of a newer thing. Um, Collegiate uh, recovery communities have not been around for very long, um, but it's growing exponentially every year um, and people have found so many benefits. So there is some uh, emerging research on collegiate recovery. Uh, if, if you want to help implement some of that or connect, um, I do know that at the SUD conference, Jessica and I will be speaking more to that and how to build a collegiate recovery program on a college campus. Um, and how that could benefit um, the campus at large and some of the other prevention activities as well. Um, but Jessica does, she's um, from 1016 Recovery Network, so a, a local coalition uh, or um, network provider um, that has gotten into uh, Central Michigan University, Ferris State University, and Mid-Michigan Community College and um, has implemented or kind of oversees their uh, recovery efforts on campus. So that could be a great thing as well. And I'm happy to connect you more with that piece. Um, and then lastly, I do want to share the MyHen page. Um, it is preventionnetwork.org backslash MyHen. And this page just has a lot of um, collective resources. I do have some information on the DFSCA if you're unfamiliar with it um, or want to know more in case that could help schools. Uh, it also has different prevention strategies and resources. Um, it has things like the College AIM and Prevention with Purpose. Um, I also put recent webinars up on that website and things like that. So lots of really great information on there as well. I think I saw a question, maybe not. Um, so with that, I do want to open it up a little bit more to question and answers. And I do want to share, I know I am moving into the executive director role, but if you want to join the network, feel free, you can reach out to me or um, our new Michigan Higher Education uh, Network Coordinator, Hara Ahmed. She uh, was my intern starting in January. She's a recent graduate herself. Um, and some of you may know her as the MODA coordinator this over the last well, four or five months. So she's going to be an incredible resource for the MyHen. with the chat where people can only chat with panelists and that might be in part of the settings. 
So I apologize. If people have questions, though, I'm happy to answer and be a resource. We have some time for questions, so if somebody has some, now's a good time to ask. But just back to that chat question for just a second. Um, can somebody put in the chat, is this, I don't know what the experience was yesterday necessarily, but I'm assuming people would see the chats back and forth. But is that the case? Does anybody know? As far as the question, Louise, I know we've talked about this a few times. Uh, but I know there's probably national data on college drinking, which you share, but mm -hmm. do, in your experience, do a lot of the Michigan higher education institutions have good data on mm -hmm. some disorders and things? And is that something that's readily available to community colleges or not necessarily? And Mike, that is such a great question. Um, so as far as Michigan, um, I'm going to back up. Every every state's a little bit different on where they are with um, statewide um, prevention efforts and data and um, uh, strategies as far as um, substance misuse prevention. Uh, in Michigan, we're probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, we do not have our own statewide survey or data collection. Um, for college campuses, which makes it a little bit more difficult to um, acquire. However, I will say there is, um, there are other um, resources and um, surveys that some schools are using. I find the larger institutions have pretty robust data. So your U of M, your Michigan State University, even Wayne State University, um, Oakland University has some of that data. Um, some are collecting it uh, usually. So the gold standard for surveys right now um, in collegiate prevention is the um, NCHA, the National Collegiate Health Assessment. And that was the slide where I shared some of the, the data points um, about the high and moderate risk drinking and then the prevention efforts. Um, that survey is pretty expensive. So it's usually the larger institutions do it annually. And then the um, the smaller schools sometimes do it every few years. Um, and if they do it, sometimes they put it on, um, public, excuse me, sometimes they use it as public record. Um, I think I have a mail coming to the door. Of course this happens. Um, sometimes they use them as public record and share it um, out to the, um, to everybody and you can find it on their website. I know Michigan State and U of M do that. If not, you can always ask. Um, usually their prevention coordinator on campus or whoever holds that data will share that um, because it's always good information to have. Um, and it shares more than just um, substance misuse. It's um, the, the health and wellness of students as a whole. Um, sometimes people also use the core survey and some of these other surveys. Um, I find a lot of times community colleges don't really use that. The only data that they're collecting is what's going on um, as far as violations on campus. And from a commuter school that has, um, may not have a um, dedicated campus safety resource um, on campus, it may be more difficult. So you may not find that data, but if you're able to survey or do anything as a, uh, as a community coalition for schools, that could be really helpful the, um, for them. And it helps create a needs assessment so they know where to go. The, I will say and note that um, the, the one barrier that you might run into with that is if you, um, if you wanna implement a survey or something like that, schools are also very afraid to share their information and data with um, publicly. So at times, um, some of these larger schools have gotten over it. Um, U of M is really good, MSU is really good about sharing um, their data publicly, but some of these smaller schools get very hesitant because when they see high risk drinking all over the survey, um, they don't necessarily want that associated with their name. They want to sweep it under the rug. Um, I will say it's not a matter of if um, for some of these issues on college campuses, it's more of a matter of when. 
um, that high risk drinking um, leads to some a horrible um, incident on campus um, that is pretty public. And so it's, it's supporting a school and saying, hey, we're gonna do whatever we can to help minimize this, um, the, whatever, whatever risks um, are involved for students and help support students. I know that was a long answer to that question, but there, I think there's a lot to that as well. Thanks, Louise. <clears throat> Kathy has a question there. Do you see that? Sure. Go outside. Was the question about um, DFSCA, the document? So in your experience, how often or common is for junior community colleges or four-year universities to collaborate in the community or each other? Yes. Um, <laughs> so it really depends on where the school is at um, and what's uh, where you are located. Um, I find that community colleges, <laughs> community colleges tend to, um, they tend to reach out and collaborate on other efforts, but not necessarily on um, substance misuse prevention. Um, I find community colleges are uh, are probably the least likely of all the schools to actually implement um, prevention strategies on campus. They have a um, non-traditional population, student population, um, so it may be older people, um, students. Uh, it may be that um, this could be their second career or things like that. Um, you also have students who are um, gearing up for a four-year institution and want to save um, money by uh, knocking out all gen eds beforehand, um, things like that. So, so there's a little bit of everything um, as far as that goes. Um, it really depends on who's, who's heading up the, the prevention efforts on campus at the time. If they have expertise in prevention or in um, wellness, public health, they're much more likely to uh, reach out and um, ask for outside input and uh, collaborate with community efforts. Um, if they are connected with, um, sometimes there is a, a personal connection um, and they're connected with their local fan chapter or they're um, connected with um, the local coalition, um, NAAA programs in the community. I find they are much more active in the community and much more willing to reach out and to connect with people um, it, it, and build that campus community um, partnership in the town gown relations. I also see larger universities. Um, U of M is really great. They have their own um, Ann Arbor Campus Community Coalition, A2C3, um, and they work really hard on town gown relationships. Uh, or their town gown relationship and um, collaborating with the community on, uh, on campus prevention efforts. Um, not for everything, but um, they also have their own department for substance misuse prevention. Um, and, and so they just have the resources to back them for that. Uh, if they don't have the resources, it tends not to be there and they tend to close off more. Um, colleges are notorious for high risk drinking and um, going out. I mean, you hear all these headlines of students going out and partying and students doing this and that and X, Y, and Z. Um, and so sometimes that impacts the town gown relationship and campuses don't necessarily want to, um, if they could kind of shove it under the rug and, or sweep it under the rug, um, they would do that. <clears throat> And they also don't know exactly where to go. So it, it, I think there are a lot of factors to that as well. Um, and I hope that kind of answered your question. I think it depends more on the school than, than whether it's a um, junior community college or four-year institution. And what's already been started prior to this. I've got one more question, maybe somebody else does too, but um, I don't remember all the details of it, but it's been some years, uh, but there are some report, research articles, something like that, that talked about how I think a lot of the higher education institutions weren't necessarily 
uh, using any of those effective strategies or evidence-based strategies or something like that. Uh, but it was quite a few years ago. And so my question is, I guess, do you feel like in Michigan, our higher ed universities are doing a fairly good job of, of implementing like effective prevention and strategies? Or do you think we still have a ways to go? Like, I don't know if you've seen that report, but it was probably eight, nine, maybe 10 years ago. I don't know if it's changed at all. Yeah, so, and that's a great question. And, and you talk about that report. I think it was very similar to what I saw three years ago um, when I first um, joined and started up the kind of revived the MyHen. Um, I think the MyHen has definitely helped. And um, it not only has it helped build those town gown relationships and kind of given um, community or um, local coalitions an in with colleges, but it is also um, a way that um, schools have started to get some of those resources for evidence-based best strategies. And they may not even realize what they're implementing or what they're doing, but they are evidence-based um, best practices. So that has improved. There are more schools doing um, collegiate prevention or um, collegiate recovery communities. There are more schools that are doing um, different social norms campaigns or um, uh, we are piloting a uh, peer education efforts on college campuses this year. And I have four or five schools who are interested in doing that. Um, so, so I think there is kind of a push to do a little bit more or to take things a step further than just tabling or handing out resources, which end up in the trash at the end of the hallway. Um, but we still have a long ways to go as well. Well, that's good to hear. Thanks, Louise. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, Sarah McGeorge here, who's got a question or comment. <clears throat> Sarah, are you on? Yes, I am. Um, this is coming from Sandy Parker. She got booted from this because of the storm. So I'm asking the question for her. Um, so she says she's really concerned. Um, most establishments and college campuses seem to overlook underage drinking and even the fakes um, kids are using. How do you fight that? And she's on FaceTime, so she's going to listen to what you have to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to manage, trying to get it so she can hear you. I love it. Technology, the things that you can do. Um, no, I think that's another really great question. And I think it's really hard um, sometimes because you have, you have businesses who, who really thrive upon, um, on, uh, on um, that, that student um, social environment um, that's sometimes created. Um, I will say as far, I mean, it's a, it's a huge liability on the, um, on the local association. So it might be looking at um, if they are part of, you know, um, a, a community restaurant association or maybe even working with Mike to um, talk to these establishments and, and sharing um, some of the risks and liabilities that they have. Um, talking about tips, trainings, things like that. Um, and I know that doesn't solve all of the problems. I know there are also outlet density issues and things like that. Um, but I think that's where improving some of those town gown relationships could be really helpful. Um, I find a lot of times in these college communities, the bars are willing to, because they don't want the, it, at the end of the day, they want the business and they want the revenue, but they don't want the liability and they don't want the issues and negative impacts that um, students have uh, or can have um, if there's a uh, high risk drinking involved. So I've seen some um, schools work with their local um, bars about how to share different um, uh, how to train um, uh, establishments in, in looking for um, fake IDs or um, to not overserve students and um, to make sure that the, that the drinking is as responsible as, as they can make it. Um, there's also, um, it, I've seen information um, hung in the bathrooms about um, where to go for help um, and support. Um, I've seen Good Samaritan provisions um, posted, things like that, um, that, that don't do a lot, but they end up going a long ways. Um, sometimes talking to these bars and um, establishments, um, other establishments, about um, what are the negative impacts and sharing that and seeing how you can minimize those um, are really helpful. I do know that there was a bar who um, struggled to keep good um, bathroom doors, um, the, the stalls. 
um, students kept breaking the, the stall doors and they were buying new stall doors like every other week. Um, and so the cost of that was adding up. And so it's just finding an in and that was their in to figure out, okay, so if we, if we help you with reducing um, uh, high risk drinking events and, and supporting, how can we make it a win-win? Um, and I know that sometimes people don't like to hear that because that's kind of uh, a scary, but um, it, it, it's taking that harm reduction approach because you can't talk about abstinence with an establishment. In the same Mike, do you have something to add to that too? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question, Sarah. But I mean, basically, I think I agree with what you said, but training and enforcement, you know, working with liquor control and your law enforcement and training people to, you know, spot fake IDs. And like I said, tomorrow from 11.15 to 12.15, um, Susan Dorak, that's her specialty. Her company uh, has an app that identifies uh, fake IDs and different things. And so you'll get an earful about fake identities, fake IDs tomorrow if you log on. But I think it's, you know, it comes down to training and enforcement, a lot of it. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Louise, for spending this hour with us, sharing some information with us. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop. We are going to...